Thank you all uh, for being here this morning. Uh, welcome to this morning's panel discussion, Tenured and Contingent Historians Together, Why It Matters. Uh, this is sponsored by the OEH Committee on Part-Time Adjunct uh, and Contingent uh, Employment. Uh, we see this as an action-oriented panel, uh, considering what to do about uh, the vast restructuring of the academic labor force uh, that has taken place in the past uh, 50 years, uh, rather than re just reporting uh, that it is happening. Um, as we all know, uh, federal uh, education statistics uh, indicate that the ranks of uh, part-time faculty uh, have been growing since the 1960s, um, up to around 50 percent, a little over 50 percent today, and that the ranks of tenured or tenure-track faculty has shrunk uh, down to somewhere around 22, 25 percent today. So the, the hierarchy looks like fit, about 50 percent part-time, 25 to uh, 23 to 25 percent uh, full-time, temporary, and uh, 25 percent, 22 to 25 percent of, of full-timers. Uh, one product of this restructuring is, uh, is in a college and university faculty um, is what uh, uh, observers call a bifurcated faculty or a two-tier faculty uh, or a caste system that features uh, a privileged uh, group of historians in full-time tenured positions on the one hand and woefully underpaid, insecure, and professionally marginalized part-time adjunct faculty members on the other hand. Uh, whatever we call it, the two-tier faculty system has cultivated um, uh, mistrust across organizational lines. Uh, some tenured professors uh, still treat the growing contingent ranks with uh, indifference. Uh, contingents look on their tenured colleagues with envy and frustration. And um, so the, t the premise of today's uh, session is that this the division of college and university uh, faculty into tenured and contingent ranks needs to be re-examined. Uh, and perhaps eliminated um, uh, so that the uh, equitable treatment of uh, part-timers can be brought about. Um, this, di this division uh, is likely very unhealthy and obscures uh, the common interest uh, that tenured and contingent historians have uh, in uh, promoting uh, history. Um, we are therefore uh, honored to have uh, three of our four expected panelists. Um, one of our panelists unfortunately got stuck in bad weather out in the southwest. This is Lillian Tays. Uh, from California. Uh, she made it to Phoenix, but then weather stopped her, uh, and she reports that she is, and I quote her, very bummed that she could not be here today. So, so, but I do have, I corresponded with her this morning by email, and I do have one pungent uh, statement that she made by email to share with you at some point in our discussion today. Uh, but we have three uh, people who can certainly fill uh, the, the full, uh, our full panel today. Uh, one to my far, uh, my far right, your left, is uh, Elizabeth Hull, uh, visiting assistant professor uh, of history at Fairfield University. Uh, and Liz has walked the walk. Uh, she has been at Fairfield for 30 years, mostly in a part-time capacity. Um, and she's taught in the Black Studies Program, the Peace and Justice Studies Program, uh, American Studies Program, Women and Gender and Sexuality Studies, and I presume the History Department, too. So. Um, uh, nonetheless, I mean, Liz received Fairfield's first Adjunct Teacher of the War Year Award in 2005. Um, she, uh, she got her BA at uh, History in Stonehill College, MA at Sarah Lawrence, and PhD at Union Institute and University. Uh, and she's currently uh, reworking, I think, her dissertation um, for publication to uplift ourselves and our race, the, the new Negro woman of the 1890s. And she's been a longtime member of the uh, Committee on Part-Time Adjunct and Contingent Employment. Um, next on my right uh, to your left is Howard Smead, um, adjunct uh, lecturer in history at the University of Maryland for almost 30 years, so he's also walked the walk. Um, he's the author of many books. I don't know how he does it, but it, was, it must be a half dozen books, a uh, half dozen books. Uh, uh, most notably, Blood Justice, The Lynching of Mac Charles Parker, and Don't Trust Anyone Over 30, The First 40 Years of the Baby Boom Generation. Uh, he has long been working for equity for adjunct uh, professors, uh, having joined the old, uh, now defunct, joint AHA OAH Committee for Adjunct Employment and on today's OAH Committee on Part-Time Adjunct and Contingent Employment. Uh, recently, he got deeply involved uh, in efforts to secure better working conditions and representation for adjuncts at the University of Maryland, and I think that's an experience he's going to be describing to us uh, today. 
Uh, and lastly, we're really privileged to have with us uh, on my left, your right, um, uh, Robert Johnston, professor of history at the University of uh, Illinois, Chicago, uh, where he is director of uh, the Teaching of American History program in which uh, he serves uh, local K-12 teachers. Um, he's a winner of number, number of teaching awards, and he will be directing an NEH Institute for Teachers on the Gilded Age uh, and the Progressive Era this summer. In fact, uh, Robert is well published uh, in Progressive Era. Uh, uh, his book, uh, The Radical Middle Class, uh, Populist Democracy and the Question of Capitalism in Progressive Era Portland, which I've used in class, um, uh, was published by Princeton in 2003 and won the Social Science History Association President's Book Award. Uh, he's written many articles on the Progressive Era historiography and now serves as co-editor of the Journal of the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era. Most interestingly uh, to us today, uh, he has been involved with the University of Illinois Chicago United Faculty, and he's got a button on, on his uh, lapel today. <laughs> Uh, from his start, and he now serves as a delegate uh, to its uh, representative assembly, uh, and he, uh, he was, I think, was deeply involved in the 2014 faculty strike at the University of Illinois, and will be uh, d d describing that experience uh, uh, to us today. So, so what we would like to do is we'd like to make this relatively informal and to uh, get you guys uh, engaged in the conversation. And so what we'd like to do is uh, up high here at the pulpit, uh, we're going to spend a few minutes having each speaker talk about their experiences. Uh, and then at the end of that, uh, probably after a half an hour, we'll come down in front so we can have an evil, even level uh, conversation with uh, uh, members, uh, members of the audience. So uh, uh, starting, you know, going across the way, uh, tell us panelists, um, should contingent historians and tenured historians work together? And for what goals? <laughs> uh, and how can they work together? So. Uh, <laughs> Well, the answer better be yes, otherwise I should just go home, because that's the premise of my, of my presentation. So good morning, everybody, and congratulations for being the largest audience we've ever been able to attract. So give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Thrilled to see you here. Um, as uh, Donald mentioned, I come from a small um, Jesuit, uh, aka Catholic University in New England called Fairfield. And um, it's a, an institution with five schools, a modest array of MA programs, plus a PhD in nursing. And it's been growing over the last 10 years in particular. And guess what else has grown over the last 10 years in particular? The use of contingent faculty. Um, so the purpose of my talk isn't to be heavy, heavily theoretical. I know there are all kinds of arguments against uh, 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 tenured and non-tenured track folks working together. I know there. are there are respected folks in the field who suggest that there should be different unions. Um, I'm gonna operate on the premise uh, that, uh, that there is some value in cooperation and collaboration. Maybe I'm just a child of the 60s and 70s, but that's the way I roll. Um, so the, 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 I'm gonna describe just briefly um, this uh, effort to affect change through grassroots efforts, task forces, subcommittees, and the central goal has always been improving the working conditions of contingent faculty as well as incorporating them into um, faculty governance structures. Uh, it's always, always been a, a sore point with me that there's no way in, there's no way to talk, there's no way to share except individually. I've had this conversation with deans over the years and faculty and other folks. Um, so we know that tenured uh, track faculty feel overworked, beleaguered, pressed to demonstrate productivity, and again, I think there's some value in understanding that even in a position of, of a, even in a very unpowerful, tangential, marginal position, it's important to understand what your allies are dealing with, um, especially on our campus, a hot topic is healthcare and the way in which uh, the university's commitment to it keeps diminishing. Um, and again, it's hard sometimes to be sympathetic to listen to that when you don't have access to health care. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's all about establishing common ground. No surprise on what happens on the other side of the aisle for folks who are non-tenure track. And you'll notice I'm going to use non-tenure track for the most part because it's the only uh, adjective I can think of that covers uh, part-time folks, uh, those who are research associates, those who are full-time but non-tenure track, uh, clinical people. So it's just for sake of a clarity, I'm gonna be using non-tenure track. It's actually what the CPACE committee uses as well. You don't need me to, rev to, to review the ways in which non-tenure 
track folks feel uh, insecure about their jobs. Uh, they struggle with few or no benefits. Um, it, it always a source of intense pain that the kind of disrespect uh, that can be meted out with uh, out of thought and, and of course uh, the marginal position that we occupy as non-tenure track folks. So there's plenty of hostility, <laughs> there's plenty of indifference, there's plenty of disparate priorities um, and issues uh, that hamper cooperation, but um, uh, I'm gonna talk about what's called the one faculty model, something that was promoted nationally several years ago and that folks on campus um, at Fairfield have taken fairly seriously. It does require more than a dialogue, not even a single dialogue. It really requires a nucleus of allies, um, constant effort to understand the culture, structures, and politics of the institution, something I've spent a great deal of time doing. Whether that was valuable or not, you'll have to tell me. Um, it does help to have an amenable administration, and what we've seen over the last two years is a change in that. And, and frankly, that has made an enormous difference from folks who are deaf, dumb, blind, and I won't fill in the last one, uh, to folks who, 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 who talk and tell you, uh, reassure you that they're interested in these issues to, to a couple of people who are really interested in affecting change. So this whole thing started 10 years ago when a colleague and I, both off the tenure track, got into an argument about what the best way to improve faculty conditions at Fairfield. She thought an ombudsperson would work, I thought entrance to governance would work. In any event, that argument led to a conversation with the dean in which we said to him, you know, this is a national trend, it's appalling. Oh, by the way, our president, who's just been installed, says this is an issue that should be addressed. And we, we, we talked him into funding a task force uh, using an internal grant. Um, and that uh, allowed us to reach out to a fairly new center for academic excellence uh, established on campus for the purpose of teaching, right? So it was fairly easy to recruit them and say, look, you care about teaching, we care about teaching. You have a significant number of people on campus who just, uh, they, don't, they don't benefit from the fact that you're in place. What, what can we do together? And so we took this money, we, we set up focus groups, we um, conducted a survey, uh, we circulated best practices from the OAH and got some feedback on that. And we, were man we did manage to achieve some small gains in office space. It wasn't terrific, but office space, email addresses, and access to the Center for Academic Excellence programs. Again, it, the earth didn't move, but it was at least something. And it did allow us to set up an agenda, frankly, for the future. Um, I won't go into the failed attempts uh, in the interim. Uh, there were many, two major, um, but we, we kept trying for longer term uh, contracts, uh, better pay, uh, access to professional development and travel funds, representation in governance, and the establishment of what we called a lecture track. And one of the things that we discovered uh, was that um, about um, somewhere under, somewhere between 80 and 100 people came back to the university year after year, and they certainly were suitable candidates for something along these lines. And, um, and we, kept, we, we kept that agenda kind of alive. Well, by 2012, the CAW and the AUP had come out with major reports, and we thought, fantastic, back in the news again, let's use this. So my um, tenure track colleague in economics, Kathy Nance, and I uh, put together a proposal, and we went, we went to what was called the Academic Council, the policy setting engine of the university. And we said, look at these new reports, look at all this information, look at how t uh, folks um, who are off the tenure track, their numbers have grown. Wouldn't, don't you think it's a good idea for us to, to uh, come forward and um, put together a task force? And, and they said yes, and so, so it really did help that, that we'd become part of the national conversation. So this task force, what was refreshing about it was that we didn't spend any time laying out the problems, right? Some of that had already been done by the earlier group, but everybody knew what was up. Everybody knew what needed to be done. And so we just went very quickly um, to what we needed to do. And I, I do have to point out there is an advantage uh, in a generational shift. We have lots of younger faculty who knew how hard it was to get a job and who had lots of friends who, who weren't getting jobs, as well as friends who were off the tenure track. So there is something to be said for this climate where, where the younger generation does understand that it, it, it's not a matter of merit or ability. Uh, in many ways, it's just a, it's a matter of luck. So I, I want to I point that out, that, that we've been able to recruit several younger um, 
uh, generation scholars who are on the tenure track, some of whom have spent some time off the tenure track, to support what we're doing. And, and that's great because they are, are heading up the local AUP chapter and that's made a difference. So very quickly, this last task force came up with the, the three main issues that we identified. Lack of voice, uh, absence of respect, and unstable employment. And um, as a result of that, we're able to spread the coalition wider, to put out flyers like this, to do some videos, um, to come up with a, 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 another list of what we needed to do to institutionalize some of these changes. Uh, so for example, the AUP chapter has been opened up to us. I'm almost finished, gotcha, okay. Um, the uh, the um, uh, uh, committee put together a um, uh, proposal for a non-tenure track handbook committee or a permanent committee to the general faculty. Um, there are several other measures we've taken, but I only have so much time left. Uh, let me just read to you very quickly what the, um, what the, uh, the purpose of the non-tenure track handbook committee is supposed to do. And, um, and, uh, and she's flipping, flipping through papers. Um, it's uh, designed to study the problems, to make uh, recommendations, to forge alliances between tenure track and non-tenure track. Um, that proposal went through the system and it was voted on yesterday. And here's, in a nutshell, uh, how good the news is. It passed unanimously. It passed without me or any non-tenure track folks there. And I'm crying because it passed because our full-time colleagues were the ones who pushed it through. And so, sorry, 10 years of work and a cold. Um, so the amazing thing is that we will now be part of the governance structure. So, <clears throat> so I'll be happy to answer your questions. Yes. <laughs> so that's that's my happy news. Now turn to my time. Yeah. Congratulations. That's really wonderful. Yeah. And I first just want to thank <coughs> Donald for putting this panel together and for all the important work that the committee is doing. And I see this in many ways as a continuation of the discussion of last night at the plenary session. How many of you were there? Any chance? Okay, right. So uh, some of you know, and I see Donald has extra copies of my University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign colleague James Barrett's proposal on unionization. And whenever it's a good time to circulate that, right? So, um, but you know, a, a clarion call for unionization here that I think is quite eloquent. So as Donald indicated, the reason I'm on the panel primarily, I think, is because of uh, UIC United Faculty's successful efforts to organize and, and get a contract and that we very firmly have both tenure track and non-tenure track uh, faculty in our union and that's really <coughs> the foundation of, of our vision for the union and a major reason for its success I think perhaps the primary reason for its success. So I'm going to narrate a little bit of what we have done but first, just a couple things. I have a, an artifact to show you. This is the Chicago Tribune from Wednesday. And this is my UIC UF colleague. And interestingly, uh, the way the Tribune on the front page decided to cover the Fight for 15 campaign in Chicago was not to focus on fast food workers, but actually on adjunct professors. And it's a really good story about uh, the conditions uh, as well as the personal stories of people. So I was very proud to see Scott, and I was right next to him, but I'm not in the picture. Yeah. Uh, okay. um, also, just it, maybe in a larger sense, maybe uh, useful for me to briefly mention a biographical fact, which is that unlike many of my colleagues, at least the ones who are from the United States, the people who are from other parts of the world say, faculty union? Yeah, when can I join? Of course. But uh, the ones in the United States are, are often very hesitant uh, for reasons that are probably quite familiar, which is that as the one lonely holdout in the history faculty who will not join our union says, well, I worked in Michigan, and you know, unions are for factory workers, not for professors. So, but even the people who've joined the union uh, face that kind of issue. But I come out of a different family background, one that was you know, determinedly lower middle class. My dad was a, a teacher for 40 years. But in fact, where unionism was de rigueur, we uh, kind of the main barbecue fights were often between my brother-in-law and my dad over the virtues of the NEA versus the AFT. And I did, had no idea what was going on for much, you know, until I kind of got to, toward the end of high school. Then I thought, oh, hmm, okay, maybe you guys should work together a little bit more. Um, so, and on the other hand, I think that a 
good number of my colleagues are involved in the union movement because they're determinedly leftist and pro-proletarian and see this as a way to unite uh, with the working class. And I think I'm, I say that in a kind of uh, condescending way. I don't mean that there are, in fact, very valuable alliances. I'm going to talk about that. But I think one of the things about faculty unionization is that it is arguably a radical attempt to revive the middle class and that we should recognize that and not run away from that necessarily. So that's kind of where it ties in with uh, some of my larger scholarly work. All right. So in terms of what we did at UIC, UF, there were certainly previous organizing efforts from what I understand going back to the 70s. Our campus is relatively young, just 50 years old. And since I joined the university in 2003, there have been two attempts to organize before ours. And both of them got basically nowhere, I think for a variety of reasons, but one of them is because they were just for tenure line faculty. And from the very beginning, UIC UF took a very different model coming out of the larger organizing efforts of jointly with the AUP and the AFT to organize a number of larger public universities. And this is especially born fruit, not just at UIC, but also at uh, University of Oregon, which had a much kind of easier time in many ways from what I understand. So why were we successful now when we basically got nowhere before in our organizing efforts? So I think we were able to very effectively use a card check system under Illinois state law. We didn't even think of going through federal law at all. Certainly even the moderate members of the faculty, for example, in the sciences, and business faculty where, I mean, there's always, I think, from what I've heard, uh, more difficulty than when the, within the humanities and social sciences, we're considerably concerned about larger issues of corporatization within the academy because it's objectively gotten so much worse. Also, with the rise of Scott Walker, there was a sense that, indeed, Illinois could be next, which it was and is now, and so that unionization might be a way to make sure that the assault on universities there uh, would be held back a bit. And also, I think the new uni organizing effort certainly didn't uh, deny that money was an important factor, absolutely. But also, it very much, we decided to talk about faculty empowerment, threats to shared governments, quality of teaching. You know, very sincerely, we felt that our union efforts would be good for the students as well as for ourselves. And I think that really helped a number of people who were on uh, the fence about joining the union, both tenure track and non-tenure track, to kind of join in the effort. But again, I do think that the most important reason we succeeded was because from the very beginning, we had both tenure track and non-tenure track people in the union, in the leadership, constantly being mobilized, and it was clear that it was one united effort. And let me just explain a little bit about mechanically what that means, is that we actually do not organize although we are figuring out ways that we can, people who are employed less than half time, in other words, the most contingent of adjuncts, are not in the union. So it's not as if we're a completely utopian institution in this regard. But anybody who's half time or more, or depending on certain issues uh, with a terminal degree, uh, can be in the union. And here's a tricky thing, which I'll just explain briefly, but I'm happy to expand on. We actually have two separate bargaining units, one for tenure track and one for non-tenure track. This was not our idea. We firmly held to a single joint bargaining unit, basically for as long as we thought we could. Uh, the university fought us very doggedly. We won our appeals all the way through the Illinois labor relations system. It then got kicked into a court where, a very conservative downstate court, where it, we were ruled against and we it was told we would have to split into two bargaining units. And we faced an, a decision about whether or not to effectively delay our ability to collectively bargain for possibly another two to five years or simply accept this and go with it. And so we do now, by law, have to have two bargaining units, but they're the same units, they're the same people. It's the same people sitting down in the morning to talk about tenure track people or issues, same non-tenure track people, complete alliance, everything's worked out together. And I mean, there are some tensions, of course, between tenure track and non-tenure track people within the union, but by and large, it's unity there, despite this uh, defeat for us. 
And despite the fact that we only uh, cover formally tenure track and half-time or full-time non-tenure track people, I would say we cover about 90% of the fact, uh, the teaching hours at the university, we cover about 90% of those within the bargaining unit. So it's pretty overwhelming. Uh, and within the structure of the union, we have tenure track and non-tenure track people represented completely throughout. Executive committee, uh, we have two vice presidents, one of them always has to be non-tenure track. The representative assembly, our contract action team, which reaches out more broadly, that kind of thing. So I think what UICUF is most known for is going out on strike last year in February 2014 on a marvelously warm day or <laughs> set of days. We couldn't believe it. we were going to delay the strike if uh, the polar vortex continued. And it was very effective, very visible. I'm, I'm hoping that some of you uh, read some of the, I think, really wonderful uh, PR that we got about it. After that, uh, we didn't get a contract, though. Uh, and demoralization kind of set in. And there was a significant movement to pretty much accept whatever the administration would give to us before the end of the year, especially because there was real concern about hurting the students. That's a, a con refrain. But then, right after spring break, Bobby Kennedy Jr., the, no, sorry, Chris Kennedy, I study Bobby Kennedy Jr. and vaccination stuff. Bobby, uh, Chris Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy's son as well, uh, the chair of the Board of Trustees, uh, they decided basically to issue a final offer to us to refuse to bargain any further, and it was a horrible contract for us. And this mobilized a faculty that was basically ready to cave, and by a 300 to 3 vote, we decided to have an indefinite strike at the end of the semester. Well, lo and behold, that worked, and we got a pretty good contract, actually. The details of which I'm happy to talk about uh, later if people want, but the main issue here is that we focused very much on non-tenure track issues. That was really the key part of it. We initially said the base salary for full-time NTT was 30,000. We said we weren't gonna settle for anything under 45. We did settle for 37.5, um, but that was mainly because the non-tenure had people said, look, we're not gonna go any further now, and let's just fight again, thank you. We also won a number of other very crucial benefits in terms of governance issues, promotions, multi-year contracts, job security, research funds, computers, this kind, uh, cancellation of classes, this kind of thing, many of the issues that are really key to contingent faculty. Uh, just very quickly, our contract expires in August. We won a three-year contract, but because we didn't have a contract before, we now, it effectively ends again. We have a terrible new governor. However, we have a seemingly another, a wonderful new chancellor who proclaims himself being a union man from a union family. I don't believe in the great man theory of history. He'll screw us over possibly as well, but, sorry, I know I'm being videotaped, but um, there's some hope that we actually could get through this, especially because the kind of recipes for success here. We have wonderful alliances with other unions now. Uh, the faculty is very tight and well organized as far as we can tell. And last but not least, the public sympathy for the union is strong seemingly, and it's strong because of the non-tenure track issue. If we were simply tenure track people, people would and did and have simply said, we're selfish, privileged people who teach two hours a week and then do nothing else for the public good. But even I talked to folks uh, who are very determinedly anti-union who say, they make $30,000, what? I, with a PhD, I can't believe this. And so that has really helped us quite a lot. So again, tensions, issues, happy to talk about that more, but I think largely success. I just, uh, uh, thank you. Thank everyone for coming. Um, we've been hearing about grassroots efforts to organize uh, on two campuses. And what happens in, has been happening in the University of Maryland system looks to be from the other side, from the top down, sort of a academic form of trickle down perhaps. So let me go through um, what has happened in the University of Maryland system. And I, I've served on uh, panels for two of the 13 camp, uh, colleges <coughs> in the system, so I have had a part in, in uh, the process in, in both of these situations I'm gonna talk about briefly. 
What happened in the system, uh, Maryland system was this. Uh, there was a vote uh, impending in the state legislature in Annapolis to uh, unionize, mainly this was for graduate students, but they decided to throw in adjuncts, whatever that meant. Um, and it, it was gonna come to the floor, and at the last minute in the governor's office, there was a deal of some sort struck, um, and that bill was pulled. And in its place, what was substituted was a mandate um, to the university system uh, to implement something called meet and confer. Uh, and the guidelines, there are guidelines, and they're, they're vague, but it, they, do, they are insistent, nevertheless. And so it was, to some degree, an effort to avoid unionization that the University of Maryland system then began to move on the issue of non, uh, contingent uh, employment. And what happened, uh, well, it, I, if I have time, uh, it really sp uh, speaks to the issue that I, a question that I have for both of you is what about implementation? Um, let me uh, explain what I mean. Um, the provost formed a committee um, with the uh, president of the university senate and, and some others on which contingents were represented and they did a, a study, exhaustive study, and came up with a, a really strong, strong set of recommendations on what to do about uh, the, the contingent issue. And it was then passed with one dissenting vote in the, in the University Senate and then sent out to be implemented. Well, first of all, let me just mention a few of, of the things that happened. Now, the, I should say, this is the University of Maryland College Park, which is the flagship campus. There are, uh, just to give you an idea, there are about 26,600 students. There are 3,000 non-tenured track faculty and 1,600 tenured faculty or tenured track faculty. Most of the teaching is done by non-tenured track faculty of undergraduates, of undergraduates. So what they decided to do was to divide the faculty into two groups, tenure track faculty and what they call professional track faculty. That would include adjuncts, lecturers, senior lecturers, adjunct two, adjunct three if it ever comes about, um, researchers, um, faculty specialist, which is a new category, I, I'm not really sure, no one seems to know exactly what it is, but faculty specialist, professor of the, of the practice, these sorts of things. And within that category, professional track faculty, there is leeway about what you, in a department, what you would call your contingent, but there will, the, the guidelines further said, there's no leeway in the contracts. They're all gonna be reviewed by the deans, answerable to the provost. That's the idea. Furthermore, they, they didn't create because it always existed, existed, but they resurrected the adjunct two level, um, which, and they lowered the qualifications for that from 36 uh, continuous, uh, credits continuously taught over some semesters to 30, and made it easier then, therefore, to get adjunct two and when you retire as an adjunct to, you can uh, petition for emeritus status. That's approved by the provost. Very encouraging. Furthermore, they added that on all committees in the at the departmental level where these guidelines are drawn up, contingent employment, employees, whatever they're called by that department, must be represented on the committees. Furthermore, they must be represented on all the promotion committees uh, for two adjunct two, perhaps adjunct three, senior lecturer, that sort of thing. All, all of which is reviewed, uh, those sorts of things reviewed uh, by the dean. Um, and so, let me add here, one of the, the ideas behind this was, is to relieve the burden to a degree of tenured faculty who are more and more, as some of you I'm sure know, burdened with committee work because there's fewer and fewer of them. And you've got more and more responsibilities. Well, you 
put um, non-tenure faculty on the various committees. Uh, some of it now is required. Uh, and that sort of lightens the load a little bit. It might also help establish some collegiality. I don't know. But one of the problems that's built into this is, as Don said, the bifurcated system. It, it, it cements it in place. You've got the research faculty, the tenure faculty, uh, the research university, of course, that's what they're supposed to do mainly, and then you've got the teaching faculty. And uh, it will make this a permanent uh, condition and the idea that that uh, that anyone, although they now have the the right to petition for a tenure job and apply for a tenure job, uh, we shouldn't kid ourselves about uh, how frequent that's going to come about. But it, it you get you get um, protection, you have recourse. An adjunct too will have, for example, uh, to get a six-month warning in writing that they're not going to be rehired. The guidelines also will require a 90-day uh, written notice of not being rehired for someone who's below adjunct too. That's pretty good, right? Okay, now, on the faculty, on the University Senate, there were four seats for contingent or non-tenure track. That will be expanded to 26 to be divided proportionally over the, the campus, this is again University of Maryland College Park, um, depending upon the, how many ad, uh, contingent faculty are, are being used in a department or a division, that, so it has to be really uh, judged because some are all, or practically all uh, adjuncts and others are not. That will be worked out, supposedly. Problem is, this is for full-time non-tenure faculty. The Part-time, below 50%, one representative on the university senate, a constituency of one for the entire campus. That has not changed. Most of what I said is supposed to be for full-time or thereabouts because we have 98%, 95% full-time, It's just which no one seems to understand. Okay, so you have all of that, and it was voted on. It was approved by the president, sent out, and here's the problem. Not one bit of it has been implemented in the last six months. Nothing. <laughs> Departmental chairs in an informal survey didn't even know about it, and they got no notification. I have no way of knowing whether that's true or not. I just assume it is. And of course, it does not mention money in terms of funding, these changes and what have you, and it does not provide for compensation for contingent employees who are on these committees, or supposed to be on these committees. So that's where it stands. Now what will happen is anybody's guess. Um, just because it's there doesn't mean it, it, it will be implemented. That, am I? All right, <laughs> let me hurry, let me go through one more thing. Also at University of Maryland, Baltimore campus, where I also teach, and I'm on the uh, adjunct faculty advisory committee there, um, meet and confer meant that that committee would act as, in lieu of unionization, uh, would act as the representatives for the adjunct faculty on uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore uh, uh, County's campus. So the first thing this committee did was to say, well, could we get a list of all the contingent faculty? That was three years ago. No list. They claim they don't have it. Uh, I proved at the last meeting that the list exists, but I, I don't know and I can't say what, what the issue is there, but we can't even call a meeting or contact all the adjunct faculty on the campus to call a general meeting. And what they did do, though, is implement compensation for working on this committee. It's elective, two-year office, uh, two-year position, you get paid one course uh, per year uh, to serve on the committee. The chair gets uh, a set fee of $5,000, which isn't so bad. But nothing that this committee has done, beginning with just a request for numbers, um, has, has been done or acted upon, things like parking and, and what have you. Um, and even though we meet 
every semester with the president and the provost, well, at the last meeting, this is how it ended, and this is where I'll end, well, at least we can try to get you some respect. So, end of story. What I propose to do now is uh, ask, uh, ask uh, our panelists uh, two questions, you know, and then at that point, uh, we can come down and join with you and uh, uh, receive your comments and questions uh, and commentary. Um, I'm very struck uh, by the three panelists' uh, presentations about the very different institutional settings in which you're, you're working. And I'm wondering if there is a single model uh, for tenure-track faculty and non-tenure-track faculty to cooperate within all these different institutional settings, or do we have to do something different depending on where you are? Yeah, I'd argue that you have to, that you, I don't need a microphone, uh, that you have to for, forge alliances no matter what the set of circumstances, whether it's a, it starts with the nucleus of the non-tenure track folks uh, re reaching out to others. Um, and, and then it also requires, I think, more effort on the part of non-tenure track folks to show tenure track folks that this is in their best, uh, this is in their best interest. They do feel overworked, and, and as Howard pointed out, I mean, our, we've gone from an incoming freshman class from 750 to 1,000, but the tenure track faculty has remained the same. And then, so there are all these demands on time. The other thing that helps, again, in terms of forging these alliances, and again, I think that's the common ground along here, is uh, you know, it, this is a compelling issue, as you pointed out. You know, when you, when you, when you tell you know, tenure track folks that you know, we've gone from 200 to 355 non-tenure track folks, and you're still at 236, full-time tenure track, they're astonished by that. But, you know, but again, I think in the scheme of things, the, the, the thing that's critical is, is uh, finding ways to collaborate, and they may vary from situation to situation, but it's also about persistence. Like you said, the, the Maryland plan is amazing. Uh, folks on our campus were just bowled over by it. But as you said, it's, it's a beautiful thing on paper that has it. So part of this involves not just collaboration, but also you know ridiculous amount of persistence, which is why I went to my 19th century vapors moment about this um, task force is finally succeeding. You know this is after like 550 you know failures, um, and again there's something to be said about voice. I, I do think more research needs to be done about how significant incorporating non-tenure track faculty into the governance structures will be. I, I'm convinced that this is critical, and I know that some of the stuff supports that. So. Again, this is about alliances, this is about collaboration, this is about access to governance. Can I just say that I think it, it, regardless of whether we're gonna have a two-track faculty system or a one faculty system, shared governance, governance is wh where this should begin, it seems to me. Uh, and that you don't have to make an option there. Uh, you don't have to choose yet. Shared governance is, is a voice at the table is, is a, a good place to start, a necessary place to start. So you're talking within a university senate or faculty senate? Or a separate committee. Yeah. I, I didn't have time to say it. UNBC, uh, the plan does not include representation on the faculty senate. Even as an observer, well, you can come to the meetings, but you can't sit at the table and non-voting staff, you don't have that. No departments have adjunct members on the committees, for example. Yeah, that's the other place I would say it's, it's vital. This is where, you know, I have a very open history department and I am actually part of the departmental structure, but that's, that's again, peculiar to them. But I think that, that makes a huge difference. Just being there, there's a huge uh, push called 2020 on campus and, and it's all about revising the core. It's not important to go into the details, but the top line says, make sure that there are sufficient resources for tenure track faculty. And, and, the, and the thing is this, is, this is mentioned in the meeting, I'm the only one there who's non-tenure track, and I said, well, that's great, but you're gonna have a lot of non-tenure track folks doing this, why don't you just add us in? But, you know, I'm suggesting if, if I wasn't there, if somebody off the tenure track wasn't there, they never would have thought of that. So it's, your, 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 your presence in the process is just, you know, critical. So I'll do a quick comment on what Howard said about shared governance and then answer your question, Donald. I think even among people who are in the union, and again, we have some people who are, especially in the sciences, really not so sure they want to be affiliated with Chicago Teachers Union, for example, which many of us are very proud to be uh, in alliance with, that shared governance and unionization are separate and antagonistic. 
And on the other hand, we have some rabble-rousing leftists who say shared governance is a total sham now. It's been destroyed. Unionization is the only way to replace. So, it, but I think the you know we're sort of slightly bit moderate are in fact seeing that unionization is what the only way that academic shared governance will be restored and revivified through uh, everyone being involved. Right. In terms of your question, Donald, I, I, it's, there's going to be an awful lot of variability for sure across institutions. But what I would, I'm finding is that even just listening to you two, I've got like all sorts of great ideas I can take back to Chicago. I think communication is a lot of the issue that we can learn from each other so much about different institutional mechanisms. I know the AUP is really trying to get the word out about this, you know, through this shared organizing drive and also the Coalition for the Future of Higher Education. It's a relatively new organization that's trying to bring these issues to the table as well. So I think, again, talking to each other across campus, cross nationally is going to be very helpful. Um, for a second question, I want to um, share with you my email exchange with uh, Professor Taze, who couldn't be with us uh, this morning. Um, and at uh, 8.51 this morning, I emailed to Professor Taze uh, that um, um, two questions that I expect to ask our remaining uh, panelists this morning are, how viable is collective bargaining as a national strategy for historians uh, to address the problems of contingency, given that the country is full of right-to-work states? And secondly, how fully compatible uh, is faculty unionism uh, with the goals of a professional society like OEH, uh, which is dedicated to, according to its mission statement, uh, excellent te uh, excellence in historical practice, dissemination of wide discussion of history, and equitable treatment for historical practitioners. And at 9.21, uh, Lillian, and sitting in the airport going back to Oakland, uh, responded to me, ah, uh, your question makes me even more bummed that I am missing the conversation. <laughs> I'm a believer in the need to build our power, uh, that, we need, uh, that we can actually win for our students, ourselves, and our profession. Uh, without power uh, and time, uh, uh, there, are, there are lots of ways to build it. Uh, we will not be able to carry forward our mission as historians or protect our work as a profession without power. So I wonder what the reaction is. Can, can I say something about this? Um, we have to keep this in mind that it, when you unionize, there is a chance, it, because it's happened, that part of the bargaining process will be in the interest of equity, and fairness. <coughs> part of the process, uh, possible results of the process, will be a loss of long-term job security. For one example, Shippensburg University in Pennsylvania pays really well. There's opportunity more than you would think uh, uh, for, for, uh, to apply and perhaps get the promotion onto the tenure track, but you can only be an adjunct for a certain number of years. And then, in fairness, you have to give way to someone else. Nobody seems to like it, but that was part of the deal. And I think as, as someone who's done this as a career, uh, two, th three, a big issue here is, is uh, long-term security. Um, and I worry, uh, with unionization, which I support, but I worry a lot about what that might mean uh, if the Shippensburg model uh, becomes standard. Everybody gets a shot, which is great, and you get paid a living wage, but it's a terminal appointment. And you know it is, at least, at least you know you're not going to be there after three years, but nevertheless. So uh, I just say, I just want to point, that has to be kept in mind. Oh, go ahead. Um, so look, I mean, right to work states are not going to be right to work forever. Uh, I mean, we hope. And so that's part of the issue is that we have to mobilize against that. Um, there are all sorts of imperfections about collective bargaining. Even if you get it, one example for ex would be, in our case, what we tried to figure out what to do about National Adjunct, wa adjunct Walkout Day, which was originally like, okay, like non-tenure track people will walk out, and then we thought, uh, hold on, like that's against our contract. Uh, we can't really do that. So we did educational activities instead. That, well. Um, so I think collective bargaining, at least in places like Illinois, are, still show that we, 
it's, we're in danger now too, but we've got to keep fighting for that. In terms of the OH, it's going to take a little while, but the OH, I would hope, will learn that for excellence in the profession, uh, professional organizations like this should be supporting unionization very actively. Whether that will happen in my lifetime, I don't know. But. You want to comment? Uh, just SEIU has been circling our campus for years now. I just <laughs> keep waiting for them to, to come calling, uh, which, is, which is kind of interesting because they've, they've reached out to us, but they, they've, they've kind of uh, stepped back in some confusion about whether or not the AUP chapter was going to serve in that, in, in that function. Uh, you know, I, I share some of Howard's concerns about, uh, about what, what, what might happen there, but I can't, you know, my feeling is I'm, I'm not getting any younger. I, I didn't have white hair when I started, and I'm just not going to wait, you know, I'm not, just not going to wait for a union to come calling. I'm just going to keep, you know, trying. We've got a toehold now, and, yeah. and I'm just going to keep at it. And uh, um, so, yeah, I mean, whatever, I, I'm willing to try the, 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 any kind of thing that will work so, and have a cascade effect. Just a, a part B to my second question, just really quickly. I mean, do you, do you see unionization as being compatible with uh, professional goals of, of you know, historians? Or are there any incompatibilities? It's, it doesn't at first blush seem compatible, but the, if the academia is changing so dramatically as universities adopt this business model, this hard, hardcore business model, then it would be inevitable, I would think, as a reaction, uh, a reaction of workers here to, to de unionize, because that's that's the that's the, the direction we're headed in. But historically, no, it seems like it, it's the last thing you would want to do. Yeah, I mean, part of my, my problem with it is that is that the class issue goes on undiscussed, uh, and you know there you know there are lots of ways in which uh, there are lots of ways in which there, there should always be alliance and common cause, but I see them as parallel issues. I think Jim Barrett's letter here is really critical and very eloquent again. And I would hope that even moderate members of the OH I know who are very leery of uh, unionization, even though they're often perceived as on the left or self-identify as on the left, uh, have no problems necessarily, in, like in 2000 here in St. Louis, taking official action that cost the organization a lot of money to protest you know, racially discriminate, discriminatory practices within the hotel that the OEH was going to be housed at. There's no reason why we can't extend that kind of model for our own workers, essentially, the historians who are doing the good work of history. And the place that might be an entering wedge, as Jim Barrett says, very well could be that when there are very draconian anti-union drives on campus, that the OEH could have a policy of officially protesting that use of yet generally state public money, but even if it's a private university, we would. Let's join the audience and get your reaction to questions. We're going to come down here, you know, we're all on the same level, we'll sit down here and then uh, uh, entertain your questions. I don't know if you have to adjust your camera. The chair closer, or uh, yeah. however it's convenient. Yeah. I just uh, just disconnected. There may be a union that doesn't want to be moving the chair. It's pretty great. So, one, two, <laughs> and three. Okay? okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Well, it's not, it's just, I, I'm sympathetic to the idea of uh, condition factor <coughs> participation and governance, but how do you deal with the issue of vulnerability? Uh, you know, we're really suspicious, a lot of people in my department, when the administration itself uh, asked us to consider whether adjuncts should have the vote in departmental meetings, when we know how whimsical their, you know, their futures how dependent they are on the whimsy of, of the department chair. And uh, that is, I know the AUP has addressed this issue too, but it's, it's a, a real concern that people who are so vulnerable will be, um, be given that, you know, what could possibly be diluting whatever faculty authority uh, there, hap there happens to be. The other issue I know you addressed, um, 
is that of exploitation. And the, you know, the adjuncts are so exploited to begin with, and then you pile more work on them in their participation. And that's nice, and it's good, and it's welcome, but, it, but it's just adding more, uh, more burden to, to uncompensated labor. You, it seems to me, you, if you're going to have adjunct uh, participation in shared governance, they have to be compensated. Uh, there's just no two ways about it. You're traveling money, uh, at least, and I'd say a, a course, or this, this happens at UNBC, I think that's perfectly fair. Of course, there's a lot of resentment uh, from, from uh, full-time faculty, tenured faculty, but um, it seems to me that that's, that's equitable. Um, and to answer your first part, uh, you, I don't think you can expect a, a new adjunct or a, a recent adjunct to uh, have a, a position or they should be entitled to a position on, say, the executive committee in a department. It's ridiculous. But I, I would ask you, do, you, do you have adjuncts that have been there, say, for three years on a more or less continuing basis? Absolutely, but, but that doesn't mean they have any more security. Well, the thing about it is, if they get on the committee, then that's a secu that is security. So I'll just uh, well, I, I, you know, I, I accept that it, there just are different environments, and right. there's some that are you know where that wouldn't have any any meaning at all, and others where it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you have to be three years at the <coughs> at, at continuously employed, being part of the departmental structure. You never vote on personnel matters. You never vote on the chair. You're not required to vote. But just the sheer presence of four or five people who have been there for a number of years, you know, it's amazing how it changes the dynamic with regard to the committee that, the, that, that just passed the Handbook Committee on Non-Tenure Track Faculty, which is a combination three non-tenure track, three tenure track. Um, the, again, they're making recommendations and they are compensated. It is, uh, it, it was in the resolution that they, that there, that there would be a compensation that results in a percentage of a, of a course. Yeah, so th that principle has been, been accepted. And I understand what you're saying, and these things still have to be worked out and refined, and, and so again, when, when we, when we wrote both these pieces, we took that into consideration, including not forcing people to vote and to making sure that votes were not uh, by hand, uh, any importance by ballot. Yeah, just it is a general matter, you're dealing uh, often with 60% of the teaching, of the faculty on any given campus. No. I mean, we just, in the interest of democracy. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's the other, the other something. It's, it's finding a way out of no way. Just quickly, I would say this is also akin, but certainly not uh, completely similar to the situation of assistant professors who are not tenured, who are vulnerable in these kinds of operations, and those people who are privileged with tenure just have to step up and help protect them. It's a kind of paternalist model. The other thing is that you grieve, 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 and you make sure that there's a full union culture that protects anyone who might be in jeopardy. It's not perfect, but... I, I, I don't know, it's just, just say it, on my case, a, 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 uh tenure track faculty member was just fired in the third year review and offered an adjunct status, which uh, you know, which just reinforces what you're saying. Yes, sir. So the, the general information question, what, what have other professions that are undergoing the same kind of, uh, uh, it's not really de-skilling, it's, it's uh, outsourcing teachers. Outsourcing. What have been the labor strategies used in other professions experiencing this? Are there any models there that are adoptable for, for academia? I, I, I don't have the answer. I'm just curious if you thought about that. I, I mean, yeah, the MLA has been a leader in this area. Uh, you go well, to let's, let's, I mean, let's not think about other, other yeah. departments or disciplines. Yeah, but file about this high on models. Things yes, like sir. pharmacists yeah. or um, lawyers, uh, you know, other traditionally good jobs that are now being turned into uh, a lot of temp work, a lot of outsourcing. Um, is there is there something, is there something, I know the SEIU has been interested in this sort of issue, but I don't know if there's something that the professoria can look at and say, this is what they did right. in that other field. Um, I, I can't say that this is the accepted procedure, but it gets mentioned all the time that the faculty are, be, are more and more becoming consultants. That's the, that's the model, it seems to me. And you hear it mentioned, at least I do, but no one, I've never seen it written or admitted that uh, we're going to continue this idea. Consultants, as you know, they might get decent salary, but they don't have a lot of the benefits, and they work for uh, on a contractual basis. Um, 
that's the best I can. Honestly. Yeah, I, no, I, I think you're absolutely right, I, and I don't, you know, it, it's been a very effective employer strategy, lowering <laughs> wages, uh, reducing obligations for benefits. I'm not sure what the, you know, what the best collective action part of the workforce is to Silicon Valley's another example of that. That's a great question. Yeah, all the examples I have are from the first story, the Vancouver model, et cetera. They're all within equity. Pilots. Pilots, yeah. right. Well, they're, they're going to get replaced by drones, you know. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> there's, there's that wedge, too, for us. It's uh, digital. What were we going to do? That is that there. Yes, uh, ma'am. You're, you're next. You're next. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. OK. Um, there's a group that we haven't been talking about. My institution also has people who've worked there for a long time, you know, in an adjunct status. And in that environment, and, and I think my campus has actually been pretty good about long-term contracts and about having people come to meetings, although no votes. But recently, I've been interviewing people who've been uh, involved in the 5 for 15 and faculty forward and adjunct action. And most of them are adjuncts who you know, I interviewed one guy who teaches at three different campuses around the Tampa Bay area, for which he's constantly in the car in gridlock and spending gas money. And he teaches 12 courses a year at these three different institutions for under 30,000. And so the strategy that they were going for, you know, one is saying, we're not middle class, we are low wage workers, right? And so we, we have no problem. I said to them, solidarity wise, how do you feel joining together with, you know, fast food workers and, you know, home health care? And they said, we, you know, we have no problem. We are low wage workers. It doesn't serve us to say we're not. Um, and then the second thing is in St. Louis, my understanding is adjuncts organize what they call the metropolitan strategy, right? Because they don't work for one university. So I just wanted to know what you guys think of all that. And it seems like it is moving. It's, 22 states or something that this SEIU campaign is now in. Metropolitan strategy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I guess in relation to the first thing you said, yeah. so certainly as last night's plenary indicated this session as well, it's not going to do anybody any good to paper over the class right. divisions, even within a joint solidarity effort, for sure. Uh, one thing I might say is even SEIU is using rhetoric of bringing fast food workers into the middle class and so on. And I think that's a, a good way to get the public involved in actually maybe a good goal. So, but we may disagree about that kind of thing. I know that one example in our union is that initially we were actually saying <coughs> adjuncts make less than a worker at McDonald's. Okay. A good point, <laughs> rhetorical point. However, somebody said, that's incredibly condescending, right? And essentially says like, you know, it's a complete devaluation of the work that McDonald's workers do. So we have a discussion, and we're not using that rhetoric anymore. Although what the McDonald's workers said to me at that meeting was, we're always told to go back to school, yeah. right? If you want to, instead of, instead of unionizing, instead of striking, right, go back to school. And so, what, and so what they're arguing is that the whole system is broken. It seems to me it's given them a much more structural analysis. And they say, you can go all the way to a PhD, and you're still a low-wage worker, so we need to rethink you know, not just the university, but the whole kind. Yeah, okay. Go, go one, ahead. One of the arguments that was made uh, on our campus was that the, the graduate students actually were making more than uh, the, yeah. the folks with their PhDs. Yeah, yeah. And so that, that worked as a better analogy. No disrespect as a graduate student, many years myself. But, but the reality is, supposedly, you've, you've done your terminal degree, and yet you're thinking. My TAs have always been yeah. more. Uh -huh. Always. Uh -huh. It's never been the case where it hasn't, yeah. hasn't been. It's one, two, three. <laughs> I wanted to hear more about the Chicago uh, or the uh, Illinois contract. You mentioned something about well, uh, half time and thirty-seven. You know, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the pay and um, what is to if, if it goes up because you have more than half time? What is to prevent the departments from lowering you? <laughs> right below half time to, um, to do that. So it, it, in terms of the whole, that whole negotiation, I'm just interested in that. Sure. So we tried to build in some protections against that kind of thing into the contract, making it essentially an unfair labor practice for departments to depart from previous employment uh, practices in that regard. And we were not not able to get that. As you can imagine, the administration found very, very hard to keep flexibility in that area. And I think even more with our new governor, that's going to be very hard to kind of win. But it is something that we are monitoring very carefully. 
And ultimately, we have to rely on our overall union fighting that kind of thing, going to particular department heads. And most department heads right now are very um, sympathetic to us. And rely on the fact that also a lot of the implementation for these contracts are going through departmental executive committees and making sure that we have plenty of union representation on them and the like. But ultimately, right, we're vulnerable. That's, uh, yeah. yeah, but um, so tell me about how many courses are full time, mm -hmm. half time, and how, I mean, because, you know, we were doing $3,000 per course so mm -hmm. to get to 30 cents is a big, <laughs> big, a really big gap. Uh, sure. Right, right, okay, so good. So, uh, full time load for uh, adjuncts is considered four courses. It's two to load at a research university. So, even there, there's a quality with the uh, tenure line faculty. So, I think that's a very important part that we were able to hold. And so, the original baseline salary for full time non tenure track was 30000 before the contract. And it was raised to $37,500. And also, non tenure track faculty before had not been part of the regular increases. And well, we haven't been receiving many annual increases over the last decade, but when they come in, they were not necessarily covered by those, and they are now. And then, as well as, for example, we had a furlough a few years ago, and which was a terrible issue, a terrible thing. But, uh, we essentially are, uh, got the money back from the furlough and redistributed to everyone in the bargaining unit. So everyone, <coughs> people equally, got a $1,500 research fund this year. non tenure track faculty never gotten any computers, and everyone now has a computer, or if they had a computer for some reason, if it's four years old, they can get a computer. So it's just those kinds of things, as well as, I think most critically, Every department needed to, at the beginning of this year, go back and formulate very concrete policies for multi-year contracts if you've been employed for a certain number of years. And then even beyond that, I think if you've been there for uh, seven years, you are able automatically to go up for promotion to clinical associate professor or clinical le associate uh, lecturer and this kind of thing. So all kinds of security issues. Oh, well, and finally, I mean, and the critical thing about those clinical positions is that the language is almost tenure-like in terms of employability and not being able to be fired. It's not quite as powerful as the tenure language, which would be, of course, is also tenuous now, but close. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I'm at the University of Pittsburgh, where um, fairly recently, I believe it was 2012, um, they um, implemented great improvements for full-time uh, non-tenure stream people in terms of faculty governments, governance, and um, uh, you know wage improvements, et cetera, et cetera. However, what I found very disturbing is the 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 administrative line on this has been well. This is great because there are a lot of faculty who don't want to be on the tenure stream because. They don't want to have the pressures of publishing, so this is great. They have the choice now of being in these non-tenure stream positions. Meanwhile, certainly when I speak to my non-tenure stream, uh, many of my non-tenure stream um, colleagues, they would love to be in the tenure track if they could be, and it's not, it's not a choice in the sense that when they get hired, they say, okay, we have two wonderful tracks. Which one would you like to take? They don't ask them, you know, which would you prefer? They're, there's uh, only certain opportunities. So. Um, again, obviously I've voted for all of these improvements, but my question is this, you know, how can we organize not only to improve um, the conditions for non-tenure stream faculty, but also to make more opportunities within the tenure track? Um, which seems like, I mean, it seems like there's very little movement in that direction um, that I would certainly like to see. Do you mean um, new possibilities for long-standing adjuncts or recent adjuncts to be, uh, apply for tenure track jobs. Uh, that that and for more tenure track jobs to be available and for there to be perhaps some kind of limit on the number of courses that can be taught by tenure stream people with the understanding that people who are already teaching those courses should have the opportunity to go into the tenure track. I mean, this is complicated, I understand. Mm -hmm. But without working together, I don't see how we can make any improvement on that. 
Um, but you are clear, though, that the, the, whole, the reason we have this problem is because there's not enough money for tenure track lines. That's the fundamental issue. Is, and that is there, there not enough money, or is there not enough money ever more to the instructional side? Yeah, okay. That's, right. Right. That's, That's the reality. That's right. That is the largest problem. Yeah. It's about where the money is going. Exactly. But, but and it's going into marketing, it's going into athletics, it's going into our campus that looks ridiculous. Um, it's like Disneyland. There's a gum wrapper that falls and it disappears in 30 seconds. It has to do with entertaining trustees. It's more up one third of our budget goes yeah. to instruction. That figure was double 15 years ago. That's right. What does that tell you? That's the problem. There's, two, there's more than one budget there. It's not like it's one lump sum of money and they divvy it up. You've got a capital budget and a, I, I, under, I, I understand all of that and I understand the three card money that goes into it. I understand yes. the politics. But the reality is, the reality is they have made a choice to divert funds away from instructional. And if they could plant every faculty member in their car for office hours and put them in suspended animation for the rest of the day so they could come back and teach, well, trust me, that's what the trustees would want. So my, I mean, again, my question is this, in what ways can we, you know, as we um, work to, ex to uh, improve the conditions of non-tender stream labor, how can we also strengthen the tenure stream and make more opportunities within the tenure stream? Is that part of the same project? It, it seems to me that it should be. So before I answer your question, uh, I'll just say if you Google massive open online administration, mm -hmm. you will find a wonderful, <laughs> deliciously uh, hilarious website. Okay, so I referred to some conflicts within our union but did not specify them. This is arguably the most important, which we have felt stymied about. Because both we, there's nothing not consensual that time we feel that we don't have the power to push that issue yet. We'll certainly have it on the agenda. But even if we had the power, we're not sure what to do because I think Howard implied this at the very least, there's conflict about do we actually want to take, say, 20 writing composition full-time lectures and convert them to 12 tenure acquisitions. In many ways, that would of course be the general fight against corporatization that most of us want. But on the other hand, it's arguably unlikely that those current full-time <coughs> non-tenure people are going to get those jobs. And so we have gone back and forth about what the proper approach for the union would be on that. that can I just add? Go ahead. Go ahead. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, I was told when I started all those years ago that if you're an adjunct for more than four years, you're used goods and no one is going to uh, consider you seriously for a tenure-track position. Um, I, well, I wouldn't go into personal experience, but I, I'm sure it's shared universally. Um, so a lot of it is, is attitude, um, and I don't know that that's going to change uh, easily. I mean, you can't really pass a, 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 a new rule, a new law on campus, uh, rewrite the plan of organization, say you have to uh, have a more open mind when you're considering long-standing adjuncts for a tenure position. And I have asked administrators uh, and, and people in positions of authority, from time to time, again, it's just anecdotal. They all say things. You have no hope of getting oh, more lines in. But there is a plan that's of getting a job. Right. I mean, if you would apply, the story's right. going to watch it. There's some folks who've talked about a teaching track that doesn't require research. I'm not so sure that that isn't going to lead to more trouble. But to me, the larger issue is it has to be about the total budget and how it's allocated. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's go on to some questions. So you're next. You're next. Go ahead. Yeah, um, that's my, you, know, you mentioned the, the, the then you. And one occasion when I was teaching, it occurred to me that my entire salary, and I would actually negotiated for a higher salary than they offered, was being paid by two students. And in many of these situations, the, the, the adjuncts, particularly uh, teaching online, are these cash cows, and full professors are teaching six people in a room, and their salary is being subsidized by the classes that have 200 people in them, or 50 people in them being taught by an adjunct. It seems to me that whether we go union, unionized or not, there's this model from, of all things, professional sports, which is there's the gross income of the profession, and there's what percentage goes to the players who are actually providing the product. And at some level, I think that argument starts to be, it needs to be happy. The gross income of your university is what? 55% of that goes to salaries, 
and why are they going disproportionately to full professors, or shall we say unethically away from contingent? Mm -hmm. And most of these problems, respect and so forth, really are secondary to the, the, the gross underpay, uh, particularly in online situations and so forth and so on. I mean, I, I really, I, I get the need for respect. My wife teaches at multiple institutions. She advocates for things. You know, they want her to come to a meeting. She's an online instructor at a school 40 miles away. They're acting like everybody's got office space when they really haven't clued in that she's sharing a desk and a filing cabinet with three others. You know, I mean, there are those culture issues where the full professors don't even understand the lifestyle of the, of the adjunct. But I think the base thing is the unethical profiteering. You know, if this if this class is bringing in this much in tuition, and I admit that tuition isn't the whole base, why is the instructor only making this fraction? It's great. It's good. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm going to disagree with that on the on the premise that that's the kind of like when you hear um, Americans opposing unions, for example, they say, why should those people have that? Rather than recognizing that those are actually the goods that should be distributed evenly. And so I think this sort of articulation of full professors have do less work in their form of blah, 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 doesn't make sense, which leads to my question, because I think the teaching track is a bad idea, um, which is now that you've achieved equality at, at your campus for teaching, meaning a full-time load is a full-time load, the traditional argument, I'm a unionized campus, and is we only hire non-tenure track faculty to teach, so we don't need to pay for service or research time. And, and so we have a much higher full-time load for non-tenure track faculty than we do for tenure line faculty. And then we worked into our bargaining agreement how we help people get compensated to get into service. But if you can equalize the teaching load, can you start providing the idea that there are research goods involved? So faculty or non-tenure line are also scholars. And that the research part of the, the triumvirate of faculty work has to be included for non-tenure line faculty as well. Has that come up? Has that, otherwise, otherwise you're destroying you know, a certain type of career, but also if we're thinking about the health of the history profession, we're losing producers to the profession, right? And, and the big argument is, well, teaching loads. You know, non-tenure line faculty don't do teach research and service, but if you equalize teaching loads, can you start thinking about the research side? And indeed, we have not collectively as a union dealt with that issue. I'm going to take it right back so that we can talk about it. However, it's happened in each departmental level as we formulated these plans for promotion and security for non-tenure track faculty. And I know in the history department, we very much said, you know, we're fully opening for the first time, which is shameful, uh, research funds to the full-time non-tenure track people. And indeed, if you want to go through the promotion ladder, you would be expected to uh, produce scholarly research. Now, we're also having a discussion that I hope is very, that's trying to be more broad-minded about what <coughs> scholarship is, and we also don't expect the same number of publications and that kind of thing. So we're, we've got that on the radar. That's right. I think the young lady over there, or then you, sir. Um, yeah, I'm a grad student um, at Harvard, and I've been involved in some union organizing around grad students. Um, we're having a sort of a, an action on teaching because Harvard doesn't have a whole lot of adjuncts, but grad students do all the teaching. Um, and I, I mean, I'm just wondering, like, how can grad? And I'm involved not so much for the next few years, but really thinking about the future um, of higher education. And I know that's why a lot of grad students are involved. And I'm curious what, how can grad students be allies and, and their relationship to Did that work at Maryland? Did you have graduate students? Well, it, it, for example, at UMBC, it's, uh, there's two different organizations. And uh, what we were encouraged to do uh, was to talk to the graduate students and see how they're running their affairs. But that's about it. Uh, there's, I don't know that it, it, it's forbidden, but there's, there's no encouragement to, to, uh, to, to, to uh, join the forces. Uh, that would be the logical thing to do. I think that's pretty normal. So I think graduate students are kind of factored off, to, or else adjuncts are factored off to graduate students. I don't know if you've been in touch with the folks at NYU and how that's put out yep. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we have very few few graduate students uh, at Fairfield, so it's, it's it's not a factor. But there there clearly should 
you know, again, I'm all for making allies everywhere. You know, the other piece, though, for graduate students is to affiliate yourselves with non-tenure track folks. You know, then there's, I know people say respect and disrespect isn't significant, but, you know, but it, but it is here, because it goes back to what Howard was saying, four years on a non-tenure track, Asa La Vista tenure track possibility. So that, that could be an interesting common cause, but to me, find an ally anywhere. Yeah, I just add quickly, first, we have a wonderful uh, historian, scholar here, who was a graduate student at UIC during all of these things, and who's now kind of out um, the tenure's job market, because we can back. And so you might have something else to say, but certainly we felt very strongly supported by the graduate students who'd been unionized much longer, and who really taught us a lot, and that's the main thing in our situation, was that, okay, this is what you're gonna be facing when, okay, I'm gonna modify my language, from the bad people who are negotiating with you, these are the kinds of things that they're going to do, which we were, we just expected they'd be nice and respectful, because we were professors, and everybody talks simply to each other. So, but they didn't do that. And all sorts of other organizing tips, so it was a really <coughs> wonderful alliance, except, I mean, they were the ones helping us. Uh, can I add to that? Uh, when you were asking that question, 10 years ago when we were, uh, when I was a fresh graduate student there, we organized the graduate students into a union. We got a lot of faculty support, so there's a lot of reciprocity there. They supported us when we needed it 10 years ago, and we supported them uh, last year when they uh, and, and were on the, uh, on the uh, demonstration and getting the word out uh, to help that. So there's a lot of reciprocity in that type of environment, too. Yes, sir. I, when uh, I, came here because I thought that we were going to be talking more about the uh, full-time faculty working closer with the adjuncts uh, because of, uh, I'm concerned about the welfare of the students. I think that if there were closer collaboration, particularly on areas of teaching and curriculum, both the tenured and the research people and the adjuncts many of whom would be research people if there were any jobs available, uh, would, that both of them would benefit, but that mainly the students would benefit. There isn't any consistency of curriculum between uh, what the full-time people are doing and what the adjuncts are doing. In other words, when I, I was at St. Louis U, after I retired from public education, I went as an adjunct at St. Louis University here in St. Louis. It was a wonderful position. Uh, I was working with adult learners. It was terrific. But they had, they had a separate set of needs than traditional undergraduates. So the, when uh, I was an undergraduate or a graduate student, we were all of a type. We all came out of prep schools. We all were, you know, and we loved to have the, the research prof who was kind of eccentric, who just came in and read his lecture and, and walked out and that was it. We'd all laugh and we'd, we'd fill in the blanks. We could do that. Now there are many, many, many more learners in the academy and these people need teachers. They need people who know how to, how to access information effectively to help them learn it. Uh, how to organize information to help them learn. Uh, there's a great deal more emphasis during the 16 years I was at St. Louis U. We began online teaching. I had exactly the same experience as this gentleman, where I was teaching all kinds of students for $3,100 $3, a course, uh, and I did feel like, like I was being used. I felt like I was the cash cop, you know, I was supporting. Uh, the guys who were uh, who got to who got to go to the library and do research and, and write uh, esoteric articles, which I would love to do, but I was working. I you know I was teaching, so I, I think that it would really benefit the students if there were if there were closer collaboration in terms of materials, in terms of curricular objectives, in terms of teaching strategies, and so on. Uh, could I just respond to that? Because um, was, this was beyond the purview of what I was offering, but you know, I mentioned just briefly in passing that one of the alliances we made was with the Center for Academic Excellence on those very issues, because more and more of the students we have coming, even the ones who are traditional students, have significant learning needs, in addition to the fact that we also have some non-traditional students, and then the online format. 
So this is why I think collaboration with centers for academic excellence are important. But this is also a professional issue. This goes back to the to the to the history departments, and that is this is where you have to include the folks who are teaching, whether they're tenure track or not tenure tenure track. And so, th I mean, th this isn't something that can be imposed from above or below, but just this needs to be a conversation that occurs within departments. And I would also like to point out the fiction of the fact that um, that, that non-tenure track folks don't do service. Yes, we may not formally be asked to serve on committees, but this is always ground what's left of my ovaries, and that is we write letters of reference, we tutor students outside class, we field text messages, email messages, we hold hands when you know Grandpa Phil had a stroke. We, we do all these things. So to, I, I know there are colleagues who are very good at fencing that off, but it's not entirely possible to do. So I just want to say in two ways, there are lots of, lots of um, instances in which we do do service, but I think alliances with Centers for Academic Excellence and then really putting pressure on the department to understand that we have a diverse student population we need to collaborate. Any comment for power? Or no, power? It's okay. it's just quickly, I feel like we believe that the undergraduates were the key to our success, despite all the other elements, and that we really needed to reach out to them and make that argument that we believe very firmly in ourselves, that right, if you're in a car on the freeway all the time, you can't be doing your best work teaching. And we got a, a lot of student support for that February strike. We were less sure we were gonna get it for an end of the semester strike that could mess up graduation and grading and things like that. Uh, let me just say though, I missed the point, but it, you don't remain an adjunct if, you, if you're not a, a stellar teacher. So, uh, I take what you're saying, but uh, if you're not if you're not good at it, you don't get rehired. You must be selling shoes or something like that. It seems to me that, that you don't buy that at all. Well, I, I wish I could, but that, <laughs> well, that's, maybe not, that, that's not necessarily. I mean, the pay is so low, and there's not really much. But there's so pay. many of us, frankly, that if we're not any good, then this is where I fall full-time colleagues. If I'm not good at what I'm doing, if you don't know I'm not good at what I'm doing, then then, then you shouldn't be rehiring me. Right. And that's where tenure track folks have to step up to the mark. Okay. Well, so, uh, so, so much disregard for the for adjunct faculty that, that, that there isn't what that kind of supervision. But I, I should add now to, to clarify, the in our in our university uh, we were evaluated by every class. Yeah. And if you had bad evaluations a couple of times, you were done. I mean, you just never saw those people again, the adjuncts. Okay, just two more questions. You, sir, and then you, sir. I have a very quick question. Um, earlier we heard um, a question about whether adjuncts um, should be given a vote, whether it thinks about governance, because their positions are so tenuous and vulnerable and tied to their department chair. And I just want to know if, in your experience, you've seen non-tenure track folks uh, who have a vote is there evidence of this? Have they sold out tenure track people, or have, have has this actually happened? Or non tenure track have voted in a way that made tenure track? I, mean, I can speak to that. I mean, I'm uh, part time at uh, Central Connecticut State. One of my employers uh, uh, in the history department there, uh, uh, two uh, of the adjuncts, uh, it's about the 20 of us, uh, elect representatives to attend department meetings, and we have a pretty significant voting rights. There are some limitations. We don't vote on, on promotions. Uh, but I, you know, I, I was a representative for a while. I voted, you know, cast a ballot for a department chair. And certainly, I wasn't selling out full, full timers. So I think uh, we very responsible uh, people to fill those positions. In my, my experience, never seen in departments so I've seen someone uh, tossed out, deprived of a class because they ran afoul of an administrator, and another person demoted from full time non tenure track to to part time. Again, running afoul of an administrator, but never within a department. General faculty. Sure. I, um, I too came here expecting this to be a little something different about full time tenure track and, and adjunct faculty working closely together. I'm department chair at Stephen F. Austin State in Texas. Um, and I have exactly the opposite problem. I've got a full time faculty of 17 tenure track people and five full time adjuncts. And I don't have a large pool on, on which to draw. We treasure those people, I need those people. Um, and we collectively work real hard to take care of them. So I guess what I'm really interested in, other than, than more money, which we're always advocating for, what's, what, are the, what are the other couple of things that I can do to recruit more adjunct faculty, which I need? Uh, stability, uh, longer term contracts, some kind of track, some kind of lecture, se lecture, senior lecture, 
um, and access to travel and resource funds, research funds. Yes, that's, it's, it's really job security, I think. Well, yeah. that most adjuncts uh, won't realize that the pay is not going to increase that much. It's about knowing where you'll be next semester and next year. I would say also that this is allowed to the to in, include the uh, adjuncts in uh, faculty activities, faculty meetings, uh, curriculum uh, things. I would one of the things that I missed the most when I left public education, where I was the department chair and I had a group of people I could work with all the time and converse with. It was as an adjunct. Uh, I was isolated. Uh, I, I didn't have any conversation with my colleagues in the history department. I met a lady yesterday, a very nice lady, who I'd met years before. She had no recollection that we'd met. Uh, and that was because she was a professor in a tenure track and a very renowned professor in the history department. And I was in a different division because I was an adjunct. She had, you know, she's a very nice person, but she had no recollection that we'd ever even met. And that, I think, is, is detrimental, not just to the faculty, but really to the students. That's the thing I keep worrying about, the students. And you, you, you have the last word, sir. Yeah. We're, we're, we're at the end of our time. Uh, thank you very much. This has been a very good audience.